everybody um, can make it to, to to all of the sessions all the time. So we're recording this for the future too. So um, officially welcome everyone um, who's here and people who, who may be watching this. Um, to our our session this morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, to we're going to be talking about the Minnesota Bumblebee Atlas today. So um, I managed to unmute myself before I started talking. So that's a good first step. Um, we're a small enough group that if anybody has has questions, feel free to to unmute yourself and and chime in, or you know, with questions or suggestions. Also, um, feel free to use the use the chat. We'll be keeping an eye on things there too as we go along. Um, so our plan for today is to have um, a outline. Um, basic introduction to the the um, to, to bumblebees and to what we're doing here with the Minnesota Bumblebee Atlas. I'm going to also, uh, after that, have some a little bit of information on, on Rusty Patch Bumblebee ID and also some other bumblebees as part of our materials that we have on the Bumblebee Minnesota Bumblebee Atlas website. We have a lot more details about how to run the methods and more details on Bumblebee ID. So this is um, a, a brief overview or a, a refresher for people that are returning, but we will um, we will have have more information available just through those online trainings. And the idea here is that you get a chance to to ask questions and and um, make sure that. Uh, that with this interactive format that um, I'm not just a talking head here, that you have a chance to um, to get your questions answered. So bumblebees are a, um, a social insect. They, so they form these nests, but they start out solitary. So they start out each year from queens that have overwintered. Here I'm in the Twin Cities in in St. Paul, and um, where where I am, it's with the spring that we've had, where it was cold for so long. I didn't start seeing bumblebees till a week ago, so the the second week in May. A lot of times, bumblebees are already coming out by the first week in April, so they're they're definitely um, behind where they were, but they're all kind of coming out at once this year. They hibernate just a few inches down in the ground and they, they dig themselves down and um, the snow cover helps to insulate them, but they also are tolerant of being frozen. So they um, they will stay there till usually till things are, are warm enough for them till there's things blooming for them to come out. Those, so those queens that are out right now, they're going around, they're visiting flowers, um, but they're also looking around for nesting sites. So when you see queens this time of year, a lot of times they're zooming around close to the ground. They're looking for some place to start their nest. And then um, once they've started their nests, they'll start collecting pollen. They make a little wax pot that they collect nectar in. And then the, the colony will start building up. So the queens keep foraging until they have their first batch of workers. After that, the workers are the ones that will see out. So one of the reasons um, we start surveying a little bit later, even though queens are out now, we want to wait till those colonies have workers. There's a lot more of them. We're more likely to find them. We also don't want to disturb the queens since they are the only link to the bumblebee population of the summer. Um, we really wanna just let them do their thing. So uh, these colonies will, will continue to grow over the summer. Eventually they will produce uh, new queens and they'll also produce males. So the workers are, are female, but they don't reproduce. They just work for the colony. And it's not until they produce new queens that they're able to, to reach this reproductive phase where um, these new queens will mate. Those newly mated queens are the ones that will dig themselves down to hibernate for the winter. 
and they are the, these new queens are the only ones that survived the next year. So that's why at this point in time right now, we just have, um, we just have queens that are out. One of the main reasons why we're doing this atlas is that there is conservation concern about bumblebees. I've been working on, on surveys with bumblebees in Minnesota for, um, since around 2007, and that was when we really became more aware of what was going on with bumblebees. We started to see, see really notable declines in some species of bumblebees. And one of the things we, we realized is that we needed to have better information about their populations. And um, so I, working on a, on a project where I was needing this information to know what was going on with bumblebees, I learned that a lot of times we had a couple years of surveys here, a couple years of surveys there, but not consistent survey effort. So um, in 2007, I started doing these surveys just in the Twin Cities. We were able to expand them to Minnesota in 2015. And so since then, we've been working on building this database with consistent surveys to be able to know what's going on with our, our bee populations in Minnesota. And you know, from the information that we've been able to gather globally, Bumblebees in general, the news isn't that great, where one out of three bumblebee species are threatened or near threatened. So that, that means um, the populations, they're, um, they're shrinking in terms of their range and where they're found, they're not as abundant. So, um, so this, the bumblebees as a whole, we consider to be conservation concern, even though some species, these, um, you know, this is just for North America, 26 of the species seem to be doing okay, um, but, but we still wanna keep track of them. So we really know, we don't know, um, you know, the future. So we wanna have information on their populations now so we can know. One of the, the ways that these data are used are for habitat management and the it, here in minnesota we have a lot of forward-thinking pollinator positive work that's going on within the within the state agencies and they've been trying to track what's going on with our pollinators and um so so one of the ways that these these data are used is we we share them with them and statewide then they're they're looking at what can we do to improve things for for bumblebees besides just this conservation concern looking at habitat management this is also just a way to connect to the bee world. So once you get out there as a, as a volunteer, you'll get to know the bumblebees, you'll get to, to see their interactions with flowers, and um, these, these connections can help us just learn more about, about what they're doing, um, open our minds and, and our knowledge base to understanding what's happening out there, seeing the world through the bees' eyes. So I mentioned we had been doing statewide surveys since um, 2015. We have a couple of volunteers here who helped with this project where we had um, volunteers throughout the state and um, our survey methods were, were a little bit different. We had kind of assigned routes that people will, were using, but we had um, pretty good spread throughout the state, but still definitely a, a few areas, um, mostly in the, the Western part of the state, especially the, the Northwest, um, where we we still need to, to get data on what's going on. So that is part of um, what we're doing here with the Minnesota Bumblebee Atlas. And we are joining in where since, since we started um, these surveys where we, we were doing these bumblebee routes throughout the state, there have been efforts that have grown since that time with some bumblebee atlases in other states and other regions um, in, in the US, so in the Pacific Northwest, in Missouri, in Nebraska. This year, there are surveys also starting up, Atlas bumblebee atlas programs starting up in California and North Dakota. So um, we decided here in Minnesota to, to merge our methods with these other state bumblebee atlases so that we can be comparable, um, not only with just within our methods, but, um, but hopefully, uh, you know, across uh, all these efforts with what's happening. 
So um, getting into the Minnesota Bumblebee Atlas, we just started this program last year. And uh, we have some, some great accomplishments just from our, our first year. We had 26 grids that were adopted. So with this Atlas program, we divide the state up into grids, which people adopt. And so we do still have 61 grids left to cover the whole state. A few of these grids, we do have information from the, the Bumblebee, the previous um, Atlas program that we did. But for, for these methods, we're still um, trying to get complete coverage just with, with these methods as well. Lots of bumblebee sightings. So we had 1,473 bumblebee sightings that, that came in through the program. And we were able to document 16 out of the 24 bumblebee species that we have as documented here, existing here in Minnesota at any point in time. So I have the on the left here, these are all of the species that were documented. And then on the right here are ones that haven't been documented yet. And there are no big surprises in this not documented here, here yet. There are a few of these. So um, Ashtonai and Variabilis are um, two species that have not been documented anywhere in Minnesota in probably 30 years at least. So we have historic records, but um, you know, we're not sure that they're still here. If there are here, they are very rare. Fraternus is a species that was just documented either last year or the year before in Western Minnesota. So as we get more surveys out West, we may see more Fraternus. Frigidus is a Northern species that also is, is not very common. Um, may show up as we get more volunteers up north. They seem to especially like bogs. Huntii is only found in extremely western Minnesota. So it's actually fairly common in the Dakotas, but doesn't really make its, its range, just it kind of barely peaks into, into Minnesota. So again, uh, we may pick that up with more western species. Um, these three insularis, um, Melanopygus and Nevidensis are also, um, especially the, the Melanopygus and ne Nevidensis are, are um, have never been very common here in Minnesota. Um, anyway, we are, we would be very excited to have any of these species documented, but, um, but no pressure as there are understandable reasons for, for why we haven't been seeing them. It's great to get all this information on all these species. This is a, a, a really nice species list to have covered just in our first year. I did want to mention four of these species were ones that are of conservation concern. So Aphinus, Fervidus, Pennsylvanicus, and Tericola are all ones that, that people, species that people are keeping an eye on for how they're doing. I wanted to point out this. Uh, we'll talk about these these yellow and and red globs that that appear on our Minnesota bumblebee atlas maps. Those are areas that have the the red especially is the area of a recent Athenus documentation. So that is the rusty patch bumblebee, which is a federally protected species. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service are tracking their populations and also are able to do some, some protection for them where, where they are found. So the, the red is an area where they're expected highly that's a high probability of finding them there and the yellow is more kind of their dispersal area where in that area you might find them there and i'm pointing out this this particular one because this is a new spot that the u.s fish and wildlife service has for habitat protection for for um sorry management um just protection of rusty patch bumblebee and that is from our one of our volunteers last year who um, who found rusty patch bumblebee. So 
that's a, a, a particular example of a way that we're able to, to use these data to, um, to, to help with, with bumblebee conservation. Getting into what it takes to participate in the Minnesota Bumblebee Atlas. There are a few basic requirements. So the first one is having time to volunteer. We really appreciate the time that our volunteers put in. There is no way that we could cover all of these grid areas ourselves. And so we appreciate the time that, that participants have to go out. And we have a minimum of two surveys per year with anywhere within your grid. We prefer to have three surveys just to, to because there are different bumblebees that come out throughout the season and their colonies kind of go up and down at different times. So if we get those three surveys per year, we're more likely to, to um, get a view of all those different species. But, but two works too, if that's, um, that's what you can manage. And we expect it to take about two to four hours to run each of those surveys. Um, and, and then in, a, in addition to that, there's time with, with transportation, um, you know, that, that four hours um, should include, you know, depending on what you have for transportation time, that's variable, but um, that should include your, um, you know, up to four or five hours includes your time for sharing your data. So you need to have some time to run it. You need to have transportation to get to your grid site your your survey location within your grid you need to have some kind of a camera so some people are able to have um take photos with their their cameras on their phone if you have a, a really good camera on your phone already otherwise a a simple um digital point and shoot camera can work um, some people do use um really nice you know digital SL, slr cameras but that's not a requirement some kind of camera that can can have a, a short focal range to get pictures of the bumblebees. You're also going to need the internet access to the internet somewhere to eventually share your data with us. For um, continuing with how to, the first step is signing up for an account at bumblebeewatch.org. So um, we use Bumblebee Watch as a a way to um, get all of our records in one place. So all of those statewide bumblebee surveys are all using Bumblebee Watch. And um, the one thing to note there, if, if, if you already have a Bumblebee Watch account, um, otherwise is to also just make sure that you're registered to participate in our project. So there is a spot there where you can sign up for the Minnesota Bumblebee Atlas. The next step is signing up for a grid. So on our Minnesota Bumblebee Atlas website, we have um, information about, about the grids and a sign up form. And we have these, these different color grids here. The, the one you really need to pay attention to are the, the green grids. And those are ones where most of that grid has um, is covered by those rusty patch bumblebee potential zones, so high and low potential zones for finding rusty patch bumblebee. And um, because of that, we are um, asking that that people who survey there have a special permit from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife um, Service. It's called a recovery permit. And um, mostly what we're doing right now, we're not asking volunteers to, to, uh, the, to, to get a permit that's, um, we, we may be able to do something in the future where we're able to get some kind of blanket coverage for volunteers, but currently we are just coordinating with other state and federal agencies with people who already have permits to, to try to cover those areas. But, if you uh, work for an organization and you do have um, have a permit, just coordinate with us. We want to to we you know it's important to get surveys here in those areas, but we're also um, really trying to concentrate with this effort on areas outside of there. We do have a, a few um, 
a few grids noted that we'll have, um, we'll just have a special training like, um, you know, this grid here, grid 38, even though, um, you know, so, so the rusty patch zone is taking up about a quarter of it. We're going to ask you to survey outside of that area if you do adopt that grid. But we'll also have some special training since you'll be more likely to to um, find rusty patch bumblebee. The other colors here, we have the higher and lower priority, and that is simply the the lower priority are ones where we had surveys last year. We can continue to get surveys in those areas, and those data are still valuable to us. We do want to get coverage um, outside there. And um, this hasn't been updated with people who have signed up so far this year. So I just peaked last night and saw we do have some, some more coverage of some of these grids from volunteers this year. So we're getting further west and um, getting some of those covered. So really appreciate people um, who are able to, to do that. But we're, you know, aside from those those green grids where we're we're leaving those just to people who have permits, we're happy with any surveys you can do anywhere throughout here. Um, those data are all helpful for us to learn more about what's going on with bumblebees. The next thing after you get signed up is to prepare for going out there. So we do have some. Um, on a lot of online training currently for um, for what we've been doing um, you know last year and and we're still mostly planning um, online stuff we do have a couple of in-person trainings which I'll give some more details about um, but um, oh I see there uh, I'm gonna pause as I see a question from Carol how would I apply for the federal recovery status um, for serving in Washington County. Um, so the, um, the, the process for the application you do, um, so there is a, um, there is an, an, it would probably be difficult for you to get that permit in time for this year because it typically takes several months for that to go through. But if you do want to do it for future years, you'll need to take some more um, advanced bumblebee identification than, than what we um, offer just um, in, in this program. We do have a bumblebee identification class that we run through the University of Minnesota. Um, typically, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service likes seeing some kind of, um, you know, specific bumblebee identification class experience working with, with bumblebees to some extent. And, and this volunteer opportunity works as experience. Um, and then, you know, there, there is a, a fee I think it's a hundred dollars, but that, then that um, permit will go will last you typically for five years. But each year, you need to say you know where you're going, what you're doing. You need to submit the data. Ideally, um, if you're if you're doing this primarily as as part of of this program, hopefully we'll be able to to coordinate. It would be best to coordinate through the program. Um, because potentially we might have other volunteers and it'll just be simpler if we can do something through the program, but that's, that's still in the works at this point. So uh, back to uh, preparing for the um, going out on the surveys, we do have um, online training so, and some webinars where we have chances for you to ask questions in person. This year, we are going to be offering a couple different varieties of in-person training. Right now, we have those just in the Twin Cities. Since this is a statewide survey, ideally, we'll be offering some of these in-person trainings in other parts of the state. Currently, we're doing this without any specific funding to support the program. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we're kind of doing what we can, which right now um, we don't have the, the travel funds to be able to, to go to, to other parts of the state. But um, we do hope to offer that in the future. In the meantime, we have these kind of you know virtual training uh, opportunities for people who are, um, who are in, in further parts of the farther away parts of the state. 
The next thing is to gather supplies. So you will need some vials. We have information and recommendations about the kind of vials that you use. Um, I should have had props here with me, but a lot of times what we use are just um, urine sample cups are a cheap, easy thing to get to, um, to collect bees into. We'll, um, some people like to use a net. You don't necessarily need a net. You can oftentimes collect the bumblebees right into to the vials when they're foraging on flowers, but um, an insect net is an option. A cooler. So I oftentimes, um, when I'm doing this out in the field, I just use a, a cloth insulated cooler that I can sling over my shoulder and carry with me as I'm moving around. Um, but if you have a, you know, one of the bigger typical coolers, um, you know, you can take that out there and, and set it someplace. It's a little bit easier if you have those, um, those kind of portable coolers. You'll also need data sheets. You'll need to plan ahead of time. So once you have your grid chosen, you'll need to look for Oh yeah, someone. I, I yeah, BioQuip is the main supplier of formerly the main supplier of nets. We need to update that because um, they did go out of business. I know there are a few other there are a few other people that were going to jump into the to the fray for um, entomology supplies. Um, I, I there's a yeah. I need we we'll, we'll, we need we need to update our link. For, um, and if anybody has suggestions, I know Carolina Biological has some insect supplies. I need to check on their nets. nets. Um, Rose Entomology make really nice nets, but they are pretty expensive. But um, if anybody has, um, has suggestions for, for where to get insect nets, you can, can share them too. The next step is to plan within your grid, choosing a location within your grid. So we do have some, some resources on the Minnesota Bumblebee Atlas website to, um, to talk about um, how to choose a location. We are currently working to, on a um, special permit for state parks and, state, and scientific and natural areas. So if you're looking at a grid and you're interested in um, going into one of those areas, those are ones where you do need um, special permit. We're doing a, a group permit as the Minnesota Bumblebee Atlas to take care of that, but we need to know pretty soon. So if you are looking at that and, um, and you have ideas about that, emailing me or Jessica or Elise with that information um, so we can, um, yeah, I think Jessica, are you trying to get that in like pretty soon, right? Yep. Yeah, I think, right, because we need a couple weeks right, to, so that it's ready for the mid-June. Yeah, so, so yeah, like within the next week, if you can <laughs> get that information in and then we'll be, we'll be turning that in. Um, so so yeah please take a look let us just at this point we don't have a blanket thing for just any state park any scientific and natural area you need to let us know specifically so we can get them listed there um, we're also going to be looking into national parks uh, let us know if you're looking at any of the the national parks um, so we can but that i think will be more of a blanket one but we're we're <laughs> it's still moving forward with that there are other like the, the state wildlife management areas. Those can be nice areas and those run a little bit more independently than the state parks and the scientific and natural areas. So usually with those, it's better to, to pick it out and then contact the manager for that specific state run wildlife management area. There are you know, also city parks, county parks. We do still have the information for the, the survey routes that we ran, and those were set up along breeding bird atlas routes. And so um, if, you, if you're struggling to find a place where you have permission, so we're asking you to, to you know, make sure that you have permission to go wherever you're going, you know, not going on, on private land if you're going in, uh, a state or county managed area that you do check in to let the, the managers there know, unless you know we specifically have permission. But these um, routes that we have set up, 
those are public access areas along roadsides. So um, if, if you're having trouble finding any of those other areas, the, these um, other routes we have set up can be a, a nice backup for that. We also have our own private Facebook group. So we only let people in who are part of the project, who are um, running surveys. And this is a place for you to connect with each other, ask questions. Um, you know, you can also ask any of us questions that are, that are you know, working with managing the program. But, um, but a lot of times it helps to, to ask other people coordinate with people who are, um, you know, there might be other people adopting the same grid and you can, can connect and coordinate, get helpful suggestions for, um, for supplies and all that kind of stuff. I also just wanted to mention for the supplies, um, especially for the, for the vials, um, if anybody, we don't want people to be, to be limited in their ability to participate in this. Um, you know, we're, we're working on, getting more funding so, so we can share supplies like this with all our volunteers. But currently, um, if purchasing vials is limiting you to be able to participate, please contact us. I know that we can find a way to, to get um, help you with supplies with things like the, the vials, maybe with, with nets or, or coolers. Um, you know, camera, you probably need to, to work that out, but just, just to let you know, please reach out to us if there's anything that's limiting your participation. So we have um, some questions here um, from, from just uh, the questions, kind of frequently asked questions, people asking, um, you know, what makes a good survey spot? Um, if we're looking for for spring flowers or you know big patch, flat pa patches of fall plants, um, roadsides with native plants, and um, really there's um, there's a lot of different different options, but you do want to make sure a lot of our the survey is kind of centered around July. So if you're going to look at any time of the year to really um, you know, have those um, flowers abundant in an area, looking for stuff that will have that kind of big midsummer bloom. That's when the bumblebee colonies are really going. Um, that that's a good way to find it. Um, and um, you know, connected to that is you know, how do you find these survey spots ahead of time, especially if you are you know adopting a survey area. A, a grid that's um, not close to where you live. There's a lot you can get from looking at at Google Maps, looking at these you know satellite photos, looking to looking for open areas. So um, bumblebees they do they do like wooded areas for for nesting areas. It can be nice to have an area that's a mix of wooded and open areas, but those open areas tend to have a lot more flowers. They tend to be where the survey where the survey effort will be be really good. Um, you can, you know, if it's possible to do a kind of a scouting trip ahead of time to go and, and look at the area. If not, you might want to just plan on some extra time that first, um, you know, that first time you're going out to do a bit of, of um, looking around to see, um, see what you can find for an area. And I'm gonna um, pause for a second because um, to see if any of the people who have, who have done this before have, have anything else to add or um, any notes from your, your experience when you were going out and, and trying to find areas to, to do surveys. Mostly my survey has been done in my yard for the last couple of years. I attended the B, Super B weekend, and then I kind of got like, um, like totally like into it. <laughs> and then with the pandemic and everything, and then I saw that this went on last year, and and I wound up my game on far as uh, identifying the bees. 
So that's what brought me here is like, okay, now I've got to get some more information for identify, identifying and, you know, the process. And, you know, now I get to actually capture the bees and photograph them and, and see them better. I, I, so that's a new, the whole new method of, that's new to me. But, you know, you try to photograph them on the plant, it's, it's just impossible. <laughs> Yeah, and we will we will have a bit of some some ID time. <laughs> Question, Elaine. Yeah. I guess I could turn on my video. Um, uh, let's see. And I'm assuming that I've I've not done this, so I'm just asking. Um, I've done the surveys, but if I have a route that goes through a a town, a smaller town, and there's uh, some native plantings or just, or native or not, I guess, doesn't, that's my question, right? Is uh, that's on public land or have permission, you know, can I survey, you know, the plantings in front of the library or whatever that, you know, as long as there's permission or it's public, it doesn't need to be out on the side of a road out in the country somewhere, or is that, is that okay or not okay? Right. Yeah. The, um, for those for those routes, the idea is is you know, yeah, finding any kind of flowers. So um, you know, native plantings are great, but there can be few and far between. And bumblebees are are generalist foragers. They're using lots of different kinds of plants. Um, and the main thing is is finding flowers for um, for those routes that are set up you know along the roadside. The idea idea is that there is some, you know, in, in most areas where those routes are, there's just kind of the publicly accessible roadway, which goes right, back, right. you know, like 10 feet or whatever it is. Right. The right of way. Yeah. The right of way. Yeah. Um, 10, 15 feet. When there's areas where, yeah, where it is in a town and um, you it can get a little bit tricky sometimes to figure out well where where does where does this end and some people you know when they have their house right there and it kind of ends up you know you can tell oh this looks like more like they're treating it like their yard um even though it may officially be public right of way um i tend to err on the side of like i'm if it looks if it looks like they're treating it as private property i, I leave it alone i right and and even when i was serving out in the country if I see that somebody's land has no trespassing signs plastered every, you know, 50 feet down the down the side of the ditch, I know that, okay, this ditch here, though, before I get to their signs is, is right away. Well, I just, I go right by there. I'm like, I'm not, I'm not looking for trouble, you know. Yeah. Um, and, and if and there whether is. Whether it's really public or not, I, I just as soon skip it. Uh, yeah, but if there is, yeah, like you mentioned, like a public library, or if there's a park that has plantings, things like that, um, most of the time those are, um, you know, it's. I mean, if it's if you're at a library and there's people right there where you can go in and tell them what you're doing, that's good. Um, I've found mostly with with city with most city parks, um, they're they're they don't really. A lot of them aren't really interested in what you're doing if you let them know even um, for, for most city parks. Um, you know, it's good if you can find somebody to check in with. It can be difficult to even sometimes find who to talk to for a city park. City parks, um, you'd, I'd be surprised if, if anyone would have a problem with you. Right, yeah. And, and I, I am specifically thinking about every time I walk past this library, there's some native plantings there. Also around the front of the library, there's a, a whole big low thing of sedum and it's mm. always full of bees and I thought you know I just skip it whenever I come through town I just skip town but I thought well I don't know I could I could survey in the middle of town right yeah yeah I think that's fine you know yeah. as long as I go in and talk to the librarians or whoever um, I'll, I'll tell you a problem that I've had in my grid or it's not really a problem it, it sounds like not a problem my grid square is mostly public land and it's really densely forested 
And so that means that, that you know, the flowers want to grow wherever there's some sun mostly. And that means roadside ditches mostly, right? It's where the Forest Service is put through a road and now sun gets in there. And so the ditches are full of flowers. And you get into late summer, and like the fireweed just fills the ditches. And I know this doesn't sound like a problem, but I stopped somewhere to survey for 15 minutes. In five minutes or less, I've filled up all my vials in my cooler. And, you know, if every stop is like that, you know, so then I have to ID bees, photograph them, whatever. And then I maybe move across the street and do some more and keep going till I get to 15 minutes. If all my stops are like that, it gets to be a pretty brutal day of surveying. <laughs> it, it takes so much longer. And, you know, I'm just like, there's too many bees here. <laughs> I know that. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's a good thing. Uh, uh, you know, yeah, a good problem to have. Um, but also, um, yeah, under understand that it's, it's um, Difficult, and it is something that, in terms of researchers, you know, when we're looking at at those kind of data, we it it can be difficult to, um, you know, whenever we're surveying bumblebees from flowers, there's this kind of aggregation effect where, you know, if especially if those flowers are kind of the only thing in the in the landscape we may think, oh, there's a ton of bumble. In your case, there's probably good habitat around, but this can happen even in the in the middle of the city where um, there's maybe not a lot of good habitat and then you have a patch of flowers and then kind of, you know, just to exaggerate, all of the bumblebees in the area are all on those flowers. And, you know, you can survey those and, and get a huge number of bumblebees. And does that mean bumblebees are doing really well there? It means there's a lot of bumblebees at those right. flowers. Um, it, but it means they eat here in the ditch and then they go back into the woods for the, you know, all the square miles around that are all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I've been places where you can drive a mile and both sides of the road are filled with fireweed, you know, <laughs> and, and, and there's so many bees on them. Um, yeah. So, you know, Lane, can I jump in too, you know, that, this is a really good conversation for me because um, that's one of the things I struggled with too, is if I'm out, so this was more when I was doing the route, um, I had that exact same experience where the ditches are filled with flowers. And I always wondered there would be like a patch and there would be a hundred bees on that. And I could fill up my whole 10 minutes. And, but I would wonder, are they all from the same hive? They're all the same species. You know, they'll all be, there'll be a hundred ternarius on it or a or hundred vegans on it. And it's like, and I always wondered for five years, I wondered, and, and what I would do is I would say, you know, especially sometimes I could actually see where the nest was. Um, and I would take a few, and turn my timer off and then also walk across, walk down a few feet or walk to a different patch of flowers or something. Because I did feel like I was going to overly um, skew the results. It's like if I just stand at this one patch for 10 minutes and, and only do those. Um, and on top of but that- But I, I would always, I was always question myself, right? Because it's like, Okay, I'm trying to do real research here. This is not random at all. <laughs> um, so, I mean, are we just, I just thought, well, I'm kind of making a judgment call here, but I wanna try and get a, a sampling of, a, of, if there's like, this was my one stop along the 25 miles or along a 10 miles of the 25 miles. Um, I wanted to get a sampling of all the different flowers. If there was, five different kinds of flowers. I wanted to get one bee from each flower or something like that. Or at least if I would see there was a different species, I would run over there and try and grab that one so that I could say, yep, there was at least, you know, an Oreocomus here with the 5,000 um, Ternarius. Um, so I think, I assume that I did the right thing. It was just a judgment call. 
Right. And we kind of, you know, whenever we're looking at, at these data, we assume those kind of things are, are happening. Um, and the general hope is that things come out in the come, come out in the wash a bit um, by having having, you know, multiple surveys done in, in different places. Um, you know, so 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 part of the survey effort, part of what we want from the Atlas is, you know, yeah, getting documentation of all those different species and, and knowing where they are. So in, in one way, that is good to, to switch. And, you know, if you are do, using that strategy to, um, to try to focus on, you know, getting more species accounted for. On the other hand, we are also just looking at overall bumblebee abundance. So we also just kind of group everybody together and are trying to get an idea of just like, as a group, what's going on with bumblebees. So if you didn't do that, that works for that also. So I think, you know, both strategies work. Um, one option, you know, we'll get more into the, into the, we're kind of jumping with, with kind of, you know, picking out your grid versus, you know, picking out your survey spot to getting into these details of the methods. But um, for the new people, hopefully things will make sense as we piece it together as we go along. Um, one option to, to help with when you do have, you know, a lot of bees there, um, the, the methods um, as we do them, let's see, I'm just going to go ahead and, and um, go back to, um, sharing this again because it's because uh, it's starting to get into the into the methods now um with so so at each um when you go to your to your location in your, your survey location you've picked out in your grid cell you're capturing bees for 45 minutes of total time you're noting the flower that they're collecting and you're um, photographing and releasing each bumblebee one option to to make things go faster when you do have a lot of bees and um and I, you know someone like like tony and karen you've had experience you know working with the bees working with identification um we do have options for you to do additional bumblebee identification training so that you can just take a one picture of each species and then give us the number that go with them. We do, before we give people permission to do that, we want to make sure that you have some experience with, with bumblebee identification so that, um, so that we can have confidence in, um, in your identifications. And that can help things go faster because um, then you can you just take, a, you still have to, to capture and count all those um, Bombus vegans, but, um, but you, can then just, you know, have, you know, photographing and uploading um, can be, that time can be reduced. Um, yeah, I mean, I think in terms of, you know, it, it is, the, you know, those where you have, you know, lots of bees that are at one spot, um, you know, it's still just a timed thing. So you even you're still just spending, you know, a certain amount of time at that spot and, you know, a certain number of bees that you're seeing. Um, and hopefully you, you know, the idea is, is you know, surveying the, the landscape. So, you know, you want to get to a spot where you're, you're at least seeing bees, but you don't, always need to go to the spot where the most bees are so um so if you know if the survey spots ideally are um you know kind of along a gradient so you might have one spot that's like that where they're really highly aggregated and then maybe your other spots are not um so so this is with this roadside surveys where we're where there are, um, where there's a, a route and you're making um, stops along that route. The other option is to just have a set area that you're surveying for 45 minutes. So you pick um, an area um, that is, you know, roughly the size of a, a baseball field 
and walking around and um, surveying within there for 45 minutes. So um, those are the kind of the, the two different ways to, to have that area. And the idea is, is just kind of just getting an idea of what's happening out there. We also ask for habitat data. So we also ask you to, at the place where you are doing your surveys, to, to um, make notes about where you are specifically, as well as observations about the, the surrounding habitat. So um, there are options to have people out there with you helping. And you know the idea with this 45 minutes of, of time where you're you know within this area is that is time collecting bees. So you'll have a, a timer and you will um, you know sometimes you have a certain amount of vials, so maybe you have the timer on and you're going around collecting bees for 10 minutes, all of your vials are filled, you stop your timer, you um, count up those bees move to a different patch of flowers, set your timer, go for 10 minutes. There's the option to have a second collector out there with you, if that's something you wanna do. If you wanna team up, um, you're welcome to do that. And um, with that, if you have um, somebody out there helping with you that can um, divide the collecting time, but only if they're also helping you to collect. So you can have someone who's there just helping to take photos, to help with tracking the data, um, but only count them as being there, and only reduce the time you're there if they're actually um, helping to, um, to capture bees. Um, so yeah, the, the, um, Dan says the California Bee Atlas has a couple of good short videos on capturing, photographing, and recording the data on your sheets. Um, we have um, a, a longer video right now on the Minnesota Bumblebee Atlas um, site, training site, but I know there are some, some new resources that, um, that they've been putting together that will we'll get them onto our, our website too, but um, the other you know, there's all these other atlas sites, and there's a little bit different resources on all of them, so um, it doesn't hurt to to explore around um, with with the other atlas sites. So once you are out there, once you have um, gathered your data, you do need to to enter the data to share it with us. So, um, so this is a really important part too. So we use Bumblebee, the Bumblebee Watch. Um, the you'll need to go to their to their website, and there is a process there for um, adding a sighting. So you um, pick Bumblebee sighting. We have um, more detailed instructions on the on the um, Minnesota Bumblebee Atlas website too. Um, but you um, Add, you add photos, you um, add your locations where you were surveying, you put information in there for the, for the flowers that you were looking at and enter your habitat and your volunteer hours. So um, the, um, for identifying flowers, so, so, so for bumblebees, we give you some information on bumblebee ID, but um, you know, you can put in, you put in IDs with your bees, but we're have, uh, it's mostly me going through verifying all of the, the bumblebees um, to make sure that they're identified correctly. For flowers, we do want you to also be able to identify the flowers that were they're, they're being um, collected from. Um, there, so we have um, a few resources to help you out with that. There's also options to, to take photos and, and share those to get identifications. If you're familiar with iNaturalist, that is a great app where you can take a picture of, of the flower, share it there, and there's a community of people that can help you identify um, those those plants, um, iNaturalist uses, um, is, is paired with another 
app you can get separately that's called Seek, S-E-E-K. And um, that uses um, computer learning to, to identify plants or at least narrow things down. So um, Seek can be a handy tool if you're wondering, um, if you don't have any clue what the, what the flower is, it can help you kind of hone in on, on what it is. Um, someone's asking, are the vials reused during the same survey stop? I asked because I was wondering if there's danger of parasites, diseases, and cross-contamination. And um, it is recommended to, to wash the vials um, in the field. Um, and so the, the best thing to use is just a, a diluted bleach, so like a 10% bleach solution. Um, you can also use an um, um, alcohol and just wipe out. That's the easiest thing to do in the field is to just have um, have alcohol and, and have uh, um, something to, to wipe the vials with. Um, it's most important to focus on this, um, you know, when you're moving from, from one area to, to another. Um, yeah, or just, you know, uh, there's pre-made alcohol wipes that, that um, you can use as well. Um, when you're within the, the same area, um, it, you know, within that, that if you're, you're within the hectare, you know, it's for those 45 minutes you're surveying there. Um, you know, I, in an ideal world, you could do this between every bee, but um, as long as you're doing it from one stop till the next time you come, um, that's, you know, that, that's the, the minimal. Um, if you, sometimes bees will, will poop in the, the vial <laughs> when they're caught. And I would say, um, you know, regard, even if it is, you know, within, in that same day, then it'd be good to, um, to clean that out because there are um, diseases that they can transfer. So I mentioned before, ideally we want three surveys um, in your grid per year, minimum of two. The ideal time is between mid-June and mid-August. As I was saying earlier, this year is a lot later start for bumblebees, but they are starting to catch up. I would say um, this year, I'm gonna be keeping an eye on what's happening with the, with the blooms. So that start time of mid-June, does kind of depend on, on what's going on. Um, if spring is really late, it might be late June. With the way weather is happening here this year, I'm thinking things are probably going to be catching up over the next month. But one thing that you can use to, um, to look at, to, to think if it's a good time to start yet, is um, those, those um, you know, early to midsummer flowers if those are blooming. So bee balm is a really big one. Um, maybe other people have um, have suggestions for other, other flowers that they've seen in their survey areas that are kind of indicators of, um, you know, good bumblebee season time. Um, feel free to, free to share or pop them in the chat. And um, when you're surveying, you can go to different locations in your grid over those, those different times. Um, you, if you've picked out a, a park that you, you like for your mid or late June survey and you wanna try something someplace else, feel free to do that just as long as it's within your grid. Um, so yeah, Leslie is saying Anna's hyssop, that's another great one. If you see, um, if you see that blooming, that's likely to be um, a good time to, to start up the surveys. Those plants are, um, are both really big food sources for bumblebee colonies, and um, usually bumblebee colonies are going pretty well by the time those plants are blooming. So besides um, our getting together today, we ha have training videos um, on the website, some just beginning bumblebee ID, which also includes how do you tell a bumblebee from other things? So we don't, we, this is starting from ground zero. So um, assuming that you, you um, may not know bumblebees from other things, there's more detailed videos about conducting the surveys, um, 
detailed information on Rusty Patch Bumblebee ID and um, also some information just about general um, bumblebee ecology and what's up with bumblebees. I mentioned we are doing a couple of in-person trainings this year as well. So on June 12th, we will be running a session where we are um, going to be just running the methods. So we're going to be meeting and going through, um, you know, how do you how do you capture bees? What data are you collecting? Um, how do we do that? So um, on June 12th from 10 to noon, um, we have the details and registration on the um, Minnesota Bumblebee Atlas website. We'll also be doing this year, I'm excited about this, doing an in-person field Bumblebee ID class. So um, this one will be, um, we're waiting a, a little bit for, to make sure that um, hopefully by that time, um, you know, things will be caught up for the bumblebee colonies and um, we'll have a good chance of having lots of bumblebees to just um, spend some time looking at bumblebees out, um, out in the field and doing um, site identification with them as, as we see them out there. So um, we do have more information um, just about some some um, bumblebee ID, which I know is um, is more fun than talking about survey methods. But um, I wanted to pause here for questions. We've had some questions as we as we move along here, um, but. Um, you know, this, uh, as I mentioned, is kind of an overview of the of the methods. There are some more um, details. We have the Facebook and place for people to communicate and ask, ask questions. Uh, we you know, want you to feel confident going out there doing that, um, doing these surveys. Hopefully, um, if you can make the, the in-person training, that might help um, boost your, your confidence with um, going out and, and doing this. Um, but before we, we move into the next kind of ID section, I wanted to pause. So um, let's see, Karen is saying that her grid number 54 has a blue area on the map. I got an email that number 54 has rusty patch, but I don't see a red yellow area. Um, yeah, so the, the blue areas Oh man, I'm trying to remember now. I'm I'm confused about that too. I did understand it when um when I did that, but I've now <laughs> forgotten. Um, well, so this it's, is Karen. It's you can just get yeah. back to me later, Elaine. I sent an email too with a question. No one's got back to me yet, though. But just get back to me later. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, but I yeah, there is it's it's another area that was designated by the Fish and Wildlife Service. Okay. When do you release the bumblebees from the vials? So, um, so we do um, have some some protocols for for how long you you hold them in the vials. So we do um, have you. One of the reasons why you have the the cooler is is to um, keep them from from overheating so that's one of the the risks of having them in the vials in the the vials if you um, you know if something happens if you you know get out to your survey site and you forgot to bring ice um, you can just capture them in the vials without the cooler but um, as you're capturing them make sure you put them in the shade and if you don't have a cooler with you um, it's a good idea to to um, stop after five minutes not leave the bees in there more than than five minutes um, and then um, and then you can go through and and um, and and release them if you have the the cooler um they're 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 generally good for a pretty long time um but um for for you know best best practices is to um not leave them there more than than 10 minutes 
So you do want to be stopping regularly if you're, if you're, you know, generally you have that, that 45 minutes, but a lot of times it's going to, as you're capturing bees, that's going to be divided up. You know, you're going to stop after, after 10 minutes, a lot of times, so you can, um, can process them. Um, yeah, the, the California survey has photo tubes for photographing bees. Uh, we did, we were able to send those out to our volunteers for the, um, our earlier version of the Minnesota Bee Atlas when we had funding to cover making those. Um, <laughs> so um, we are working on getting getting funding to, to help cover um, those kind of supplies that we can send to volunteers. Um, we also have, I can, you know, we made these tubes ourselves. So um, we can share instructions for using those. In general, um, my experience with those, um, I know there's a couple of volunteers that, that worked with those too. Um, a lot of times I've found just having the bees cool down, um, you're able to get better photos of them. So, so part of putting them on ice is keeping them from overheating, but it also cools them down. They're um, you know cold-blooded animals. So um, when they're cooled down, they slow down. A lot of times you can, um, if they're on the ice for 10, some of the bigger bees, it might take 20 minutes for them to, to actually cool down to the point where they've stopped moving. Um, that way you're able to, to get um, better close-up photos. Um, the, the tubes can help, um, but a lot of times they'll still have their their wings over features you need to see or or things like that um but um yeah um karen and tony i know you both worked with the with the photo tubes and i yeah. didn't care for them um the one exception would be bees like oricomus that are so huge they take forever to slow down and then once once they're slowed down and you try to take pictures, they warm back up in like a minute. And, you know, I remember once trying to take pictures and having to put them back in the cooler again. And so I think that was the only time I found it useful. Other, other than that, like you said, they slow down. And I just felt like I could open up my container and take pictures of them and, you know, they just sort of slowly moved around and that let me get all the pictures I needed. Yeah, that, that's what I did too. Um, I, I think I had two of those photo tubes because um, you guys were kind enough to send me a second one after I broke the first one. Um, and I can't remember what, what it befell it, be, but um, I, I did not have as much success with those either, trying to get the bees in them and get them situated just perfectly. I found it faster to just make sure I had about five pounds of um, ice and I would break the ice up so that it would be more chip-like um, so that I could put my vials right down completely in the ice, but being very careful. And I, I have to say I use those really small, um, like not Tupperwares, but uh, Rubbermaid or um, Glad, any of those that you buy in the dollar store or grocery store that are just the really small ones work perfectly and they tend to be a little more watertight than a lot of other kinds of vials. Um, so I could put my vials right down into the ice um, and cool the bees down really fast. Um, Sometimes I would even put a few chips on top of the of it so that they would cool down fast. Then I could just open the container up and take a picture of them right inside the container. Um, and then I would just put the container under in the shade, go on to the next one. By the time I was done photographing them all, um, they were all warmed up and flowed away. Um, so that worked out really well for me. It, I, I had real troubles with the photo tube, I admit. Yeah, and, a, and a good point there with the, um, with the watertight, you want to make sure that your, um, your, your vials, when you're putting them on, on loose ice like that, that they do, um, that they are, if they don't have holes in them, um, because that will, you can end up 
drowning your bees if there's melted ice and it's getting into to holes in the vials. Um, there's sometimes when I'm collecting bees where I where I where I am gonna keep them longer and I'll I'll use ice packs. Um, it does, but it does take longer for them to cool if you're cooling them down to the point. Um, you know, where you, for photographing them, it is good to get that get that vial kind of surrounded by ice so they do um, get to the point where they're they're passing out and they recover quickly. So at first you might be freaked out, you know, opening up, seeing all these bees, you know, that are just <laughs> completely still. Um, and they'll they'll sometimes get a little twitchy, but um, but they they recover really fast. They take off and a lot of times they're just right back where you got them from and within, you know, within within a minute. Yeah, I, so I did the road surveys for five years and I really got, um, for those who are thinking about a road survey, I do think the road surveys are much easier to do than the 40, last year I did the 45 minute area survey. Um, and I thought the road surveys were a little easier to do because I could take a big cooler, lots of ice. Sometimes I would take two coolers um, so they would have plenty of ice. I bought like 30 vials um, so, uh, those little Rubbermaid cups or Glad cups, I think I ended up using those the best. Um, and I would just put the cooler in the back of my truck and, um, you know, pop up the top and put the thing. <laughs> and I just had a process where I would go out, collect the bees, bring them back, put them in the ice, open them up, take their picture, mark down what they were, um, and go on. Um, so if, and I, I think being able to have your car with a big cooler in it, um, is an easy way to, to do it. Um, because taking the photographs of them is the most time consuming, difficult part. I think catching them is really easy. <laughs> They're so, they are so, um, into what they're doing. They don't even know you're there. I mean, you could catch them in your hand if you wanted to. I mean, they they just become so obsessed with the flower they're on. They don't notice that you're sneaking up on them with a little cup. Um, but taking the photographs was is definitely the most time consuming part. Yeah. So I um I do. Yeah, the um, Karen has some some good points about the practicality. Um, one of the the reasons why we're excited to to have this option for the for the going off of these routes and and picking an area to survey in is to just get information about what's going on in those areas and getting information about habitat besides roadside habitat. So roadside habitat is important. There's a lot of roadside habitat. But um, there's a lot of stuff going on in, in other habitats too. Um, so so um, especially if you're looking at a grid where there's an area that um, that you think looks really interesting, if it's if it's kind of you know unique habitat that's in that area, um, it'd be great to have have surveys that are right you know in those areas. But the the roadside habitat, we got a lot of cool information from those surveys and um, and yeah, we we want, um, we, we appreciate what our um, participants are, are doing and um, the time you put into it and either whatever kind of method you're gonna be using following either the, the roadside protocol or the, um, the, the more open grid protocol um, point survey, those are, all those data are gonna be useful. So whatever works best for you, we're happy to have um, have you out there. Well, yeah, so Elaine, I think this year, since I am going to be in a new area, I've picked a large recreational area um, right outside of Walker, Minnesota, called Shingabee Recreation Area. And I've been there many times hiking and um, so I've kind of got an idea of, you know, how big it is and, you know, what about a hectare would, would be out of the place. But I think I'm going to invest in a cooler with wheels. Mm. And um, 
And that way I can still do my regular process of having this big cooler with lots of ice in it because that, that does seem to have worked the best for me. I'll be curious to hear how that works. Yeah, well, I'll let you know. <laughs> so uh, when you're serving and you got an area, you're supposed to kind of map out an area about the size of a baseball field or a football field. And then my understanding is you spend 45 minutes scouting that whole area collecting bees. So if you come, my understanding, if, if I come across an area where there's a whole bunch of bees, I don't want to spend 45 minutes there because I want to get that bigger area. Is that correct? You, it's kind of a balance. So, you know, within that bigger area, you're really focused on, on the flowers. So, um, you know, if that, you know, you, you do want, you don't want to spend the whole 45 minutes in that, in that one spot, but um, generally, you know, I, I look at it as a lot of times flowers are kind of clumped. So there may be, you know, one big patch and, I, you know, it, it may, you know, depending on the size of the patch, maybe you're there for 10 minutes, maybe you're there for 20 minutes. Um, but then you do want to, um, you know, keep, keep moving. Um, you know, even if you haven't gotten, you know, you don't feel like you've gotten every single bee that was on that patch. Um, but, um, but you do want to count, you want to count all your time that you're looking for for bees so you don't need to be at a patch and then move to you know stop your timer move to another patch start your timer it's all of your looking time because we want to have an idea of what's happening over that landscape right. so um so yeah once you once you kind of get to your survey spot you can start your timer you know maybe it takes you five minutes before you find you know a spot where you see a lot of bees you can can stop um, stop there and, and, you know, continue collecting and then just pausing for your processing time. Do you, do you pause? Like you go, okay, you like, okay, I've spent 10 minutes in this area and I'm going to go and look some more areas. Do you stop the timer or do you just keep the timer going? Cause you're still looking for bees, but you you see the another patch of flowers way up there. It may take you 10 minutes to get to it. I would um, stop and process your bees that you have. So, you know, if you have five or 10 bees that you collected at that spot, um, I would stop. Okay. Um, oops, I'm frozen. Sorry, I was frozen there for a second. <laughs> um, um, you know, let them chill down, photograph them, record their data, let them go. And then, um, count your time as you're moving to the next patch. So once uh, you're done processing, you can start your timer again, move to the next patch, collect, um, you know, once you have have enough bees to process again, you can stop your timer. Okay, that makes sense. And that seems like a good idea too, because once you release them, they mostly, you see them, they just go right back to the flowers you caught them on. and then I feel like I'm probably not catching the same bee again because now I'm going to go over to that other patch and do some more, yeah. you know, and hopefully yeah. this bee is staying on this patch. You release them back where you got them from. Yeah. 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 Makes sense. Yeah. And I mean, they'll, they'll, they generally fly pretty far. They know the area that where they're in. So, you know, if you do bring a bee over, you know, 500 feet, they're going to, they're not going to be lost. But they'll, they'll they might fly. be mad because you stuck them in a neighborhood they don't like. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you get good photos, do you need to catch each one in a vial? Um, we do, um, just for, part of that is is kind of you know what tony was getting to where there there's a bunch of bees kind of coming back to the same patch um you know if you take if you're trying to take photos of bees they're moving around and then did you was it this one that you took a photo or that one that you took a photo of um i it's really 
ends up you end up having more confidence in in knowing who's who if you if you take them um you know cool them down make sure you're getting getting a set of photos so we um we'll talk a little bit about the the photos too here what we're looking for there okay. but but it does help to have multiple photos of each bee sure sounds good thank you yeah um, we do, there is the option. So, um, you know, I mentioned those areas that are, that we um, ask people to, to stay out of, um, unless you have a, a Fish and Wildlife Service permit. There is the option to still go into those areas and not handle the bees. So the main thing is, um, you know, so, so these, the methods that we're using are very low risk, but they're not, a hundred percent um no risk so um you know something could happen where yeah i mentioned you know water could get into the vial or um as you're catching a bee in a vial it it moves and gets in the way and you know the the idea with the where we have this federally endangered species is we want to have you know zero risk to them and um so so for them, there is the option to do just a photo only survey. So that would just be going in and taking photos of, of bumblebees in those areas um, that we have marked off as being um, high potential for us to patch bumblebee. And maybe that's a good segue if, unless people still have more questions. I was going to share some, some rusty patch bumblebee information so um i so did yeah. have a i did have a quick question okay yeah um, I, um so like you're concentrating your data on these right around these specific windows of time and so i'm doing other big research collection for other projects and if i have co complementary data that's kind of neat that could be used in the bee atlas. Can I put that in there at any so, time? Yeah. So any um, the the bumblebee atlas data is really specifically with that with the project and with the habitat data. All of that kind of stuff um, is you know entered in. You're entering it in specifically for that for the Minnesota Bumblebee Atlas project within Bumblebee Watch. But in Bumblebee Watch, you can put any bumblebee observation. Um, so it won't give you places to put in all of the, the habitat data. But if you're just if you're taking photos of, of bumblebees, either there or iNaturalist are both good places to share those data. And um, yeah, bumblebee researchers are always looking at both of those sites okay. to get information about who is where. And, yeah, and what I, I flowers would, they're using, all that kind of stuff is, is, is great information. I'm, and another one now is called the Great Sunflower Project or something. Mm -hmm. yep, so I'm yep. going to be planting sun, those, sun, those particular sunflowers uh, within the next week or so in my yard. Great. Yeah, and I think that the um, especially iNaturalist is a nice one to pair with that with a great sunflower project. Um, as you're recording your your bees that you see there, you can also um, take photos and upload them to iNaturalist and get um, you know get some good IDs associated with them. Yeah, I've been using the I, iNaturalist for about two or three years now. Great. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so um, Rusty Patch Bumblebee, we have a few just special things around um, dealing with, with surveys in areas where these are found. You know, we're really lucky in Minnesota to still have them here. So we um, want to make sure that they're, they're doing okay. They, you know, there are these areas that are, are marked off, but um, the, historically, almost the entire state was uh was an what was included in their range where they were found so it is possible to find them anywhere so anytime that you're out collecting we want you to keep an eye out especially for rusty patch bumblebee so uh, we'll talk a little bit about how to identify them um, in a second here but if you do suspect that you're that you're finding them we want you to, to pause your survey, 
identify the bee. And um, if you do recognize it as a rusty patch bumblebee, to photograph it and release it as soon as possible. If you do find a rusty patch bumblebee, you can complete your survey that day at, at the location where you are. We ask that if you do see other bees that look like, like they're rusty patch bumblebees that you avoid collecting them. Um, if, and also, if you you know when when you have those photos and your location to to email me or the our bumblebee atlas account as soon as possible um me is best because um the um i will find that email sooner than i will um if you're emailing to the to the bumblebee atlas account on the next survey date, here's the tricky part, is that uh, on the next survey date, you'll need to pick a different location. It may be disappointing. You, it's exciting to find the Rusty Patch Bumblebee and you know you wanna keep finding them, but um, logistically, and, and in terms of what, we're, what we need for the Rusty Patch Bumblebee, we know they're there. We need, need to know where else they are. So if, if you have other surveys, um, sorry, my internet's kind of getting glompy. If if you have if you have other parks that are nearby, then um, let's see. Am I am I, are you hearing me? It's saying I have low resources. Okay, we can hear you. We can hear you. Okay, if you can if you can find other survey areas nearby then that can help us expand where we know that they are. Um, so we will do, if you do have a grid where we um, want you to have some, some special training, we are gonna do a separate session that's just on digging into Rusty Patch Bumblebee even a little bit more than we do here. Um, we do still need to just set the date for that. It'll be in early June. Um, that is required for a few grids. So when you adopt a grid, you're, um, we let you know about that. We do recommend it for everyone. We'll do a little bit here. So everybody has some, some basics on Rusty Patch Bumblebee, but it doesn't hurt to have more. So getting into how do you do this? How do you tell if you have a, a Rusty Patch Bumblebee? We're lucky in that the Rusty Patch Bumblebee is pretty distinctive in their color pattern and they're pretty consistent. Some bumblebees are really variable. Rusty Patch Bumblebee is very consistent. They have this black kind of T-shape. It's kind of shaped like an umbrella, um, thumbtack shape. They have these black hairs that go between their wings and some black hairs coming back towards their abdomen. On their second segment of their abdomen, so bumblebees have these separate segments, which can sometimes be hard to see in the field, but um, the, the, for Rusty Patch Bumblebee, their first segment is all yellow. Their second segment is mostly yellow, but they have this rusty patch in the middle of it. An important thing to note is that there are yellow hairs um, on the back edge of that segment. There's other bees that will have this kind of a rusty patch, but it goes right up to the, the black hairs. The males are very similar color patterns, so you can just look for the same kind of thing there. Here's some photos. So you can see or you can really see this um, umbrella shape on the thorax, um, the, the rusty patch in the middle that's all surrounded by yellow. Here's a side view where you can see this, this rusty patch coming in. And um, the, the rusty patch itself can vary in the shade of um, shade that it is. Um, it can be kind of this brownish or it can be, um, it's never really super bright orange, but it can be a brighter orange. They can also fade. Um, the um you know bumblebees can also lose hair so it can look like it's it's black when it's not uh, so if quickly just a few of the bumblebees that are you can confuse with them the brown belted bumblebee they do have these the same pattern with the uh, these kind of rusty brown hairs on their second abdominal segment but they have the black hairs right underneath it 
they also do not have that band of black hairs on their thorax. So here's a photo here. Uh, you know, a lot of times the wings are covering up the abdomen, but we can see um, the rusty hairs are right next to black hairs. This bee is really common up in northern Minnesota, the tricolored bumblebee. And so if you're doing surveys up north, you're like really likely to see these bees, which have really bright orange. But this is, um, they do have this kind of umbrella shape on their thorax as well. But for them, it's the entire second and third abdominal segments that are orange, and then it's yellow again, and then black. And here is a photo, so you can, can see it's really, it's pretty bright orange usually and um really big it's not a patch it's the entire second and third segments. the color can fade over time um but but again um a lot more yellow there one of the trickier ones can be um the half black bumblebee and um, they have the entire first and second segment are yellow and the rest are black. Again, um, no T-shape there, no rusty patch. But a tricky thing is that sometimes, depending on how the light is hitting them, on that second abdominal segment, if the hairs are thinner, you'll see their dark cuticle, their dark integument exoskeleton can can make it look like there's a, a darker patch there. Um, for um, so you just need to for them you need to to look look carefully make sure you you um, if you think you're seeing a rusty patch look at it from a few angles make sure that it's um, that the actual hairs are um, are rusty and they're not just yellow hairs that are are, are showing through there. Rufus cinctus, the red-belted bumblebee, these are really variable in, in their color patterns, um, but um, they will sometimes have, have um, red hairs, but, um, and they do also have black hairs between the wing bases, but um, they will have, um, a mix of if they when they have red hairs, it's usually red and black hairs kind of mixed together. Um, they're not in a patch. Um, they're um, they can sometimes have um, black down their their abdomen, um, but they won't have that 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 rusty patch. They won't have that um, that T shape. So here's what I'm what I'm talking about with those kind of mixed hairs. They, they're they're also really shaggy bees. They have kind of longer hair. Um, so the the color pattern's different enough to tell them apart. One of the trickier ones is um, this the this lemon cuckoo bee. So cuckoo bees they don't make nests like other bumblebees. They go in and take over the nests of other bees. And the males can be really common in late summer. So um, mostly when you're out in August is when you'd have a good chance of seeing these bees. They do have this, this black T shape, but they, they don't have the rusty patch. The yellow on their abdomen goes down through three segments. Um, and they, they also have these really big heads if you're looking closely. Um, here, are the, the female color pattern is really different, so you don't really need to worry about them. It's the males that you need to um, need to watch out for. And so here, here you can see a little bit of what happens when you see the kind of dark exoskeleton coming through. It can look like those are darker hairs. These are all yellow hairs, but they just look a little darker because of the, the angle of the photo. So here you can see a lot more yellow down the abdomen than the rusty patch bumblebee. Um, I'm also just gonna talk about a couple of the common bumblebees that you'll see out there. And this one, it's common name is the common Eastern, um, especially in late summer in the Southern part of the state, these are really common. 
these um, bees have their first abdominal segment is yellow and the, the rest is black. They have this kind of tear shaped where um, where they do have some black hairs kind of coming back, but again, not the band between the wings. They only have yellow on their first abdominal segment. Um, bees can lose hair while they're out there. So this is a photo showing um, you know what what they can look like as they spend more time out there. Um, when you're looking for color patterns with the hairs, be aware that that sometimes they just lose their hair as well. So here's another photo where you can see that kind of um, where the hairs, there's a few black hairs and it kind of thins out um, on the thorax. First segment is yellow, the rest are black. For the, the two spotted bumblebee, um, similar to the common Eastern, they have the the first segment is all yellow, and then they have this W shape in the middle of their second segment. The males can be a little tricky. Sometimes they have a lot more yellow on them down through, through the abdomen, sometimes not. And here's a photo showing that, that really distinct W shape. This is, looks like a, a queen, a nice big bee. You can really see the, the W there, the two spots. And yet someone sees mostly two spotted bumblebees in their yard. They are, they can be really common, especially early season. So they're, they're usually some of the first queens out in the spring. They make their colonies early. And then actually a lot of times by the middle of July, they're already on their way out, which is part of the reason why we ask people to do a few surveys. They're one of the ones where if we don't get out, out there earlier in the season, we might um, miss them. So again, rusty patch versus everybody else. There's a, a photo of the rusty patch, that T on the thorax, rusty patch. Um, this one with that swoop, that one is the brown belted. This one with the, the kind of mix of colors on its abdomen and really variable. This is just one of the ways it can look as the red belted. This one that has that same um, kind of umbrella, black umbrella on the thorax, but the distinct chunks of yellow and orange and then yellow again is the tricolored. This one that has the first two segments yellow is the half black bumblebee. This one that has that kind of umbrella, it's usually a little thicker, but then three segments yellow is the lemon cuckoo. And then these other two pretty common bumblebees that are less confused with rusty patch, but just going over them here because they're very common. The um, common Eastern bumblebee has the, the one stripe of yellow and then this one with the two spots on the abdomen is the two spotted bumblebee. For um, photo tips, for, for taking photos of, of um, bumblebees, so um, if you're doing this either out on the flowers or if you do have them chilled down, it really helps to have um, a, these three different angles at a minimum. So it really helps to see the color pattern on the abdomen to see clearly what's happening there. A lot of times we need to look at what's happening on the face. So if you can get a straight on shot of the face, there's also different color patterns that you can see better from the side. So having a view from the side. Um, most cameras and phone cameras have a macro setting so you can get up close it does help if you can can get as as close as you can and focus in, especially if you're taking photos of bees on the flowers. One trick can be to use your video setting. Um, just take a video of the bee. If you have a camera that has um, high quality video, you can then capture stills and get the different angles. So, um, you know, if you if you are taking photos of bees as they're moving around on flowers, they can move around really quickly. Sometimes um, with that video there, um, you can, um, you know, you can can capture the stills. Oh, and um, 
Dan has suggestions if with an iPhone, the the live photo option. So I've never I've never worked with that, but um, do you have any 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 suggestions for using that? The the iPhone, if you change it to live photo, it takes a series of of good quality photos, and so many times, so like you go like, oh, I got a another B out of focus. But if you go into edit and you do the live photos, you'll see about 15 photographs and you might even actually see the B fly in. So in that grouping, you'll see, you can pick out sometimes a photo that you can actually use. <clears throat> Whereas a video it always seems like the picture quality is less. So to find that white right one. Um, so I think the live photo has been done, been doing really well for me. Great, yeah, yeah. I wasn't aware of that. That's um, if you if you have that, that sounds like like a good way to go. We do have a couple of um, camera recommendations. Um, if you're if you want to point and shoot, there are um, there are a few that have um, at least really good um, close up photo options. Um, uh, there's one from Olympus and one from Canon that um, they have something called microscope mode. So you can get, get even closer than you can with a typical um, macro. Um, and, and they make those, they're, they're super durable, good, good field cameras. I wanted to get into, um, I'm gonna, uh, hoping to ex expand on this information I have here um, for photo tips. So, so besides just those, you know, with these three different angles, for most of the the bees that we talked about, that works great. We'll be able to get to a species level identification. There are a couple of species that we have here in Minnesota that are really tricky to ID from typical photos. So, um, so I have a couple suggestions for um, for dealing just information about dealing with these pairs that are really close. So I talked about the half black bumblebee, that's Bombus vagans. Um, it's really similar to Bombus sandersoni, um, which is Sanderson's bumblebee. Vagans, um, if you're in so the south part of the state, um, we don't need to worry about it so much. Probably everything you have is Bombus vegans and um, typical photos that you have will work if you're kind of um, if you're from the Twin Cities south if you're surveying anywhere north of there it could also be Sanderson's bumblebee which they have um, just looking at their color pattern their color pattern is the same what we need to look at are these things that are really close up on the bees. So um, not just their their head, but we need to look at this space. We call it, it's their cheek or their malar space that goes between their eye and their mandible. Sometimes you, if you can, if their if the bee is chilled and completely out, and you can get close up and the, you can get good lighting, people can share photos where we can see this difference. So it's this kind of subtle difference where their malar space is longer in Vegans, shorter in Sandersoni, and it's kind of the ratio of the, the length, the width that we that we look at. Um, so this is one, you know, we, a lot of times we end up just lumping these two species together for, in the Northern part of the state. It's nice to be able to pick them apart if you can get a nice photo of here was mostly kind of the side of the head close up um, looking getting their little cheek that would be great unfortunately for the males their cheeks don't work so much and we need to look at their antennae so this is even harder to get a good picture of it can happen but um but here it's these segments of their antennae that that um we look at the the length there to tell them apart so this is super detailed information, but um, you know, and we're okay with lumping. But if you're able to get good close-up photos, um, that can help. Um, and Karen, Karen mentioned these can be um, can be uh, very the vegans 
especially can be really common up north. Um, you may have a lot of these to go through taking pictures of and um, may not be able to take all the time to make sure you have the antenna in focus. <laughs> and that's okay, but just letting you know um, if you want to, um, to really get to species level ID for your, for your area for all of the bees. The other close pair we have is Oricomus and Pennsylvanicus. Um, oh my gosh, I'm so bad with the, the common names. The black and gold <laughs> is the common black name for Oricomus. <laughs> And the American bumblebee for, for Pennsylvanicus, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, and as you can see, their color patterns are really similar. This is a little bit more of a case where um, we would love to be able to tell these apart because there is some conservation concern for, for Pennsylvanicus. They can be, Pennsylvanicus can be really common actually in the Southwest. Minnesota, um, but we do want to track them if we can. The color pattern is variable, but um, sometimes just getting a good photo of the abdomen is enough. There tends to be more yellow on the first abdominal segment for Pennsylvanicus, and there tends to be black on the kind of front of the second abdominal segment for oricomus. Um, but since that does vary, it can be tricky. There is this feature on the head where we're looking at, so for bumblebees, they have their big eyes on the side and then they have these little eyes on top of the head. Um, and there is a difference in kind of the where their eyes are in relation to each other. If you get a photo, this is the best angle down from the from the top of the head. Sometimes you can see it if you just get a shot on from the face in the front. Um, but um, but yeah, it can be helpful to have this shot of um, from from more of the top of the head to be able to see. Um, what's going on with that to tell these two species apart from your photos. The other thing is um, really difficult to take a photo of is um, this, this feature on their, their hind leg. So, um, so if you, so this is the part of their leg where they have their, their pollen basket. And right below that, the leg segment right below that, um, on the inner part of that, there's a spine that is really long and sharp for, for Pennsylvanicus and is really short for Oricomus. Um, yeah, so so um, do you do you squish your cold bee to get good close-ups? Usually if they're if they're cold and they're they're passed out, you can kind of move them around a little bit. Um, you know, you can you can um, move them around to angle them. You can kind of move their, their wings a little bit to, to, you know, get a view of their, their abdomen. Um, you know, you, the, you can, if you're trying to get this, this leg, you can kind of, you know, move their leg out. Um, but it, um, so they're usually pretty, um, you know that they're small and and delicate still, but um, sometimes I even just use my my pencil or pen that I have with me to to take notes to to kind of you know move them around a little bit. So um, yeah, I don't know any any other suggestions. Um, so yeah, there's there's people here taking taking great photos. Any other general photo suggestions from from people? I guess one suggestion that I have is when they're chilled and they're really not moving much, you know, you can oftentimes when I catch them in the vial, I'll get end up with a bit of flour in there because that helps me remember what flour they were on. You know, if you stick a little piece of flour in there, they'll usually just sort of grab onto it. You can hold it in your hand and turn it around 
to get the angles you want, they'll mostly just sort of hang on and you, you can just turn it whichever way you want. So you get the face, you get the, you know, makes it easier to maneuver them rather than having to, they're sitting still and you're trying to maneuver yourself. Oh yeah, I, I'll second that. This is Karen, I'll second that. I, I have lots of pictures with them clinging to a flower and you can, you know, and they'll actually, even if they're pretty sleepy, as long as they're chilly, um, they'll continue to hold on to it. You can even almost turn them upside down and they'll try and crawl up and right themselves and then they'll move around a little bit. You can, you can really manipulate them if they're attached to a flower. That's a really good idea. I, I always wish there was a, like a, a camera little fixture that you could take your cell phone and, your, and clip onto the, to the flower so the flower doesn't move around and the bee's still there. Because if the flower moves and the bee moves, it's just like it's hopeless. <laughs> yeah, it's it's when it's when there's any kind of wind, it gets gets really difficult. <laughs> um, I wanted to make mention just a couple other other resources for for tracking bees. So I did mention um, iNaturalist. Um, iNaturalist is a nice one because um, especially if you're interested in other kinds of bumblebees. So we've been talking all about bumblebees, but there's lots of other bumblebees. We've got 480 plus different kinds of bees in Minnesota. iNaturalist is a great place to share information on those other bees. If you're out taking photos and you want to know what's there. Um, I also wanted to mention the back backyard bumblebee count, um, which I, they're just picking out the 2022 dates. So um, so we don't have those to share yet, but um, we'll be sharing those through the, the B Lab. Um, let's see my low system resources, hopefully I'm coming through. And this is a, a, a limited window of time where we're trying to get a lot of people out just taking photos of bumblebees all over the place. This is usually the time of year when the rusty patch is most common. So um, getting out there and and keeping track of bees, we do it through iNaturalist, but there is a project within iNaturalist so we can share extra information about how long you were looking, what, um, what, bee, what, what flowers you found the bees on, which aren't typically things you can add in um, in iNaturalist. The um, Fish and Wildlife Service, if you're interested about Rusty Patch Bumblebee and want information, they've updated their website recently, so it doesn't look like this anymore. Um, but they do have um, have a lot of great resources for um, for just Rusty Patch Bumblebee if you have questions about um, their their conservation, about land management, um, things that are that are happening with them. Um, so. Um, I we're we're getting down to the to the last few minutes. Um, I do have um, more, I have lots more resources for for Bumblebee ID. We just did a really quick thing, but um, you know for for getting to know bumblebees more, we have um, resources in the, the um, Minnesota Bumblebee Atlas website, but um, we have more things that we're adding in there. We do a, um, a six hour Bumblebee um, ID training that focuses just on Bumblebee identification that we offer that um, once a year. It's the class is currently running, but I have resources from that class I can share. If you just let me know that you're interested, um, I can can share those with you. If you really want to, um, if you're going down the road of of really wanting to get to know your your bumblebees really well, um, I can share those resources. Um, as I mentioned, we'll we'll have these um, other trainings. We'll be announcing the the rusty patch specific one. Um, we'll have the the in person trainings. We have the the resources online. Um, we'll probably also just 
do once um, once people start going out. We might just have a um, another Q and A kind of session for once, especially if you've had a chance to get out there and um, do your first survey run. Um, so. Um, you know, you can um, then come, we'll come together just in case you run into more questions. Usually that happens once you go out there and, and start doing it. You might <laughs> think of things that you didn't think of now um, for questions. Any other um, thoughts or questions? Are, are, people, are people excited about getting out there and, and seeing the bumblebees? Sure, absolutely, I am. I want to I want to practice in my yard so I haven't found any bumblebees in my yard yet. <laughs> That's disappointing because the, the dandelions and the creeping charlie are there. <laughs> it really is just like the last week and a half that I've started seeing them around the Twin Cities. Um, up, up north, they're probably you know just going to be starting, and that the queens, you you know they they do show up at, at flowers, but they spend a lot of time just zooming around looking for for nests too. So it can be harder to track on them because they um, they're particularly zoomy. I saw one uh, at a nursery yesterday in uh, Hugo, so it's like hey. <laughs> Nice. Yeah, it's um, probably in the next couple of weeks we'll start seeing the the um, bimac, the bimaculatus, the two spotted workers. Oh, so um, queens are already out in Cass County up north. So I think this. I mean, yeah, everybody knows this spring has been pretty weird, um, cold for a long time, but then hot and and everything's everything's catching up. I think. Um, well, thank you everyone for um, for joining us on, um, you know, at least for me, it's still kind of early for a Sunday morning. <laughs> uh, other people who are morning people <laughs> were probably up at five, but I appreciate your, your spending your time with us. Um, you know, please do connect to, um, if you have questions about um, wanting to find places within your, your grid, or if you're doing the, the routes, if you have any questions about, you know, where you should go, um, where you want to survey, we can can help connect you, um, any help with, with resources for, for identification, or if you do need help with, um, with vials or anything like that, please reach out and let us know. We're excited to, um, to have, you, have you join us. We'll be looking for your um, bumblebee data to start coming in. All right, thank you everyone and um, hope that you 